much there, Jennifer, for everyone yeah, that's planning so. on this. So, I'm trying Darcy, to get my video. Oh, great. Darcy, it looks like we're not going to have cable tonight. So, um, hold on. We just, uh, nope, we have two people from our last meeting, but. Um, okay. Yeah, so I don't know where. Just do the Garrett regular recording Richard. then, like you normally do for the hearing, so we've got the, the audio. Yeah, we're still recording. Okay. So I think, Tammy, we are ready whenever you are. Okay. I think we're ready. I will call this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. on July 13th, 2020. Uh, let's start with a roll call of Commissioner Peterson. I'm here. Commissioner Richard. Pack. <laughs> Commissioner Pack. Here. here. Great. Commissioner Schrodel. Here. Great. Commissioner Murphy. Here. Commissioner Pasco. Present. Commissioner Phillips. Here. Commissioner Wilson. Present. And Commissioner L L Lopez. No, absent. Okay. And I think, and uh, Commissioner Stevens, I'm here. <laughs> okay. And public comment. Do we have any, Darcy? Um, nothing beyond what was sent this afternoon. That's okay. the most recent, as far as I know. Okay. There's nobody who wants to provide any general comment in the audience, right. as far as I can see. So for audience members, um, if you did want to provide comment, you would need to do, use the raise hand feature. And this would be for anything that is not on our agenda tonight that you just want to provide general comment on. And you see none, Jennifer? Very Correct. Good. Okay. All right. So without having to go through all the initial uh, reading and introduction of the public hearing for ZDO 276, we will take off where we left off, which was what we will. Um, we, we closed the public uh, testimony part. We left open uh, the written testimony. And then after Glenn reviews that, I think we'll be moving into deliberation. So Glenn, I believe we're, you're on. Great, thank you, Chair. I'll mm -hmm. just uh, share the screen right now. <clears throat> all right, I hope you can all see the first slide. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, so this is the continuation of a public hearing on ordinance ZDO 276. This was the proposal for certain minor and time sensitive comprehensive plan and zoning development ordinance amendments. And uh, I'm just going to start with a quick summary of what all the various documents that have been sent out to you since the last hearing, just to make sure that you have them all. Um, and we'll address them in just a little bit of detail afterwards. There should be two separate memos, one from myself and then another from the long range planning manager, Karen Burig. And those together address some of the questions that you had at the previous hearing. So two separate memos. There should be a document labeled attachment E. These are revised amendments to four specific ZDO sections, as well as to chapter four of the comprehensive plan. And I'll explain what those revised amendments are, but there's a document attachment E. There's attachment F, that's just those San Diego wireless guidelines that uh, we were brought up in the last meeting. And so uh, you have it all before you now. There's attachment G uh, that is from the transportation engineering division. That's a visual that we can use to sort of discuss what the impacts of the proposed DLO amendments would be um, on some fictitious lots if you want to. And then finally, there's actually three total comments that have been submitted since the last public hearing to now. So um, there was one from, I believe, uh, Miss Wolf with historic downtown Oak Grove. There was a comment from a marijuana retailer. And then today there was a document that was forwarded to us by Mr. Joseph Edge. So those are the three comments. Um, attachment E with the revised amendments. Well, the additional amendments that are proposed in this attachment to comp plan chapter four, they're just to uh, double down essentially on the proposal that edible and drinkable products be allowed to be retailed on site in the general commercial uh, areas. There's a passage in the 
chapter that we notice after the fact that should be clarified with the proposed amendments as well. Um, ZDO section 401 for the exclusive farm use district. Well, uh, we corrected uh, what is indeed a typo uh, that Commissioner Phillips identified at the last hearing. So that's been addressed in the revised amendments. Um, we've also decided to expressly list these uh, non-conforming secondary school expansions as a, a land use application type, in a sense, in a use table. Um, and then uh, we clarified that certain optional land uses that we're proposing to allow in the exclusive farm use zone would not, according to state law, be allowed in urban reserves. Um, we made a similar change to section 406 for the timber zone, where we're proposing to allow uh, accessory dwellings for family forestry, as you recall that new use would also not be allowed in urban reserves. So we clarified that in the updated amendments. Then uh, some conforming amendments to section 407, that's the ag forest zone. Basically all of the uh, necessary changes that would be applicable in the ag forest zone are made there as well. Then finally in section 835, the revised amendments uh, address the discussion we had last time about a color for small wireless facilities. We amended the proposed language so that it doesn't just say it has to be to match the color, but a, a similar color. So those are the only changes that we made. I mean, only to those four ZDO sections in that one comp plan chapter. But maybe what I'll do just uh, quickly is we can go through, uh, Chair, if that works. Um, mm -hmm. Each of the 24 general actions that this package would address and I'll just remind what they're about and then we can decide if uh, that's something we wanna have further discussion on. So the first issue was about increasing the noticing distance in rural areas. Again, the board proposes something that is more extensive when, than what the planning commission originally suggested for consideration. It would be an increase to a half mile for all uh, um, uh, type three applications and then those select land use applications that are type twos. Uh, is there an interest in having more discussion about that? And, and I just wanted to note, Glenn, um, there's 24 of them. <laughs> so yeah. you know, if people have uh, concerns or some questions that have not yet been addressed, we want to pull them for further discussion before we vote on them. But, I, you know, if we've kind of talked it to death and we've got our answers and we understand, then then we can just move on and keep moving. I just want to kind of add that. Can I, before we move on, let me just clarify, Chair Stevens, that I think I understand the, the uh, goal here would be to pull out, basically set aside the ones of the 24 that the whole commission is happy with the staff recommendation. So we wanna sort of sort those from the ones where you might have questions because you're not sure if you're happy with it, or you know you want edits that you wanna to talk to the rest of the commission about, or you know that you aren't prepared to vote to recommend adoption and you wanna talk about that. So we're trying to get two lists. So then the idea being maybe we get to the end and there's 15 of them, everybody's good to go and we need to talk about the rest. And so then that, dis that discussion will happen after we've sorted these into two, is that correct? That's exactly what I, I think is the most effective and efficient for this evening. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so the staff's recommendation on action number one, again, would be to increase the noticing distance in rural areas for type three uh, applications to a half a mile and then for non-conforming use applications and vested right applications those would also be uh, extended to half a mile in the rural zones. So at this point uh, if any commissioners feel that that needs to be pulled for further discussion um, I guess speak now or forever hold your peace and we'll move on to number two. So is there anyone that would like to further discuss that this evening? Okay. Great. I think number one's our first one on the approved list. <laughs> Very good. Uh, the next one was about reducing the kennel setbacks for uh, commercial kennels in the uh, rural residential areas where that use is allowed. 
So the, the staff's recommendation would be to reduce the minimum setback requirement from 200 feet from property lines to 100 feet. Is there any interest in discussing that further or is the group uh, okay moving forward with that recommendation? I did hear some negatives about that when I brought it up uh, to some people that I was around and uh, they said that would be an astronomical mistake, but 200 feet isn't any different than 100 feet when you're talking about a kennel. They said, because you can hear them for a mile. So, uh, you know, it, if it means more kennels in our particular area, I think we could live with that. But uh, there was some negative feedback, I felt, when I had spoke to other people about it. And I would like to pass that on. So. But you don't, you're not requesting that we pull that out for further discussion, Merv? No, I don't think so. I think okay. Uh, okay. what I heard was, you know, horses make a lot of noise too. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, especially at dinner time. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'll, just say, I'll just say there that, you know, I'm, I'm certainly willing to, to vote with the staff's recommendation. I, I still seriously question what, what the difference between 100 and 200 is or, and whether that even requirement should even be in there given the other protections in the code. I just, I, I'm not sure what we're trying to accomplish, but if, if that's the staff's recommendation, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Any other comments? Okay, Glenn. Okay, yeah, uh, action number three is to allow the manufacturing of goods retailed on site in uh, certain commercial zones. Um, and the staff's recommendation is to only allow, to only newly allow the manufacturer of edible and drinkable products that are retailed on site in those select commercial zones. But there was some discussion at the last public hearing about maybe expanding that to include other uses, um, the manufacturer of other goods, that is. Um, so uh, curious if there's an interest in having more discussion about that tonight. I would appreciate that being on the more discussion list just to talk about the public comment about the artisan manufacturing. Yes, and I do have a fire issue. Uh, I'd like to discuss about that. Okay. Okay, so let's pull number three for further discussion. Okay. Uh, action number four was uh, the recommendation of staff to allow, as the state now allows us to allow, land divisions in the EFU district that result in parcels smaller than 80 acres when necessary for siting approved utilities. Uh, I don't think there's been any, um, there's been much discussion about that as yet. Uh, any interest? Okay. Uh, number five was the recommendation of staff to allow uh, equine therapy as a use in the exclusive farm use and ag forest district. Okay. Uh, number six is the re recommendation to allow accessory dwellings for family forestry in the ag forest in timber zones. So this would require that the parcel be at least 80 acres in area there must already be an approved dwelling on the property. The accessory dwelling would be for a family member when necessary for additional housing in support of a, an active family forestry operation. When this was discussed at the end of the last calendar year, the planning commission was generally supportive of proposing it uh, with the added requirements that the accessory dwelling be a manufactured home and use the same driveway as the primary dwelling. Staff estimates that maybe no more than 60 properties in the county could even qualify um, for the dwelling and staff is recommending to allow this use. Okay, um, number seven is uh, a mandate to essentially uh, allow and provide a pathway for renewable energy facilities that meet certain criteria uh, in the exclusive farm use district. Uh, and I noted that uh, Commissioner Phillips had identified uh, something last uh, time 
that was indeed an error, just a miscitation, and attachment E corrects that. Um, action number eight is a proposal to increase the opportunities for which a fee can be paid in lieu of the construction of certain road frontage improvement requirements. Um, I suspect there might be an interest in discussing that further tonight. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Action number nine is just to amend the code so that our ex parte contact definitions match those with state law. Glenn, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is Brian. I just want to know, I don't have Karen's memo in my packet. At least I can't find it anywhere. Um, and so I would appreciate a summary at some point when we do discuss that, or if someone could, could forward it to me, that would be great too. Sure. Thanks. Yes. And I could also just bring it up on the screen. Uh, yeah, either, either way. I just, maybe it's here. I can't find it anywhere. It's at the very back of mine. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do some more digging. But if, if someone has it handy and wants to send it to me, that would be great too. Very good. Uh, any interest in discussing the ex parte contact definition? It is state law anyway. <laughs> um, number 10 uh, is the proposal to adopt certain standards and review procedures for small wireless facilities. Uh, the proposal and recommendation from staff is to have all small wireless facilities as those are defined by the FCC to be regulated not by the zoning code, but separately under the county's roadway standards. And a copy of those roadway standards were provided uh, uh, ahead of the earlier hearing. And last week we had, or last time we had some significant discussion about that and happy to have more tonight if you would like to. Yes, please. Great. Uh, Was that a uh, yes, pull it for further discussion? Yes, please pull oh. it so we can talk and discuss it more. Great, thank you. All right, action number 11 would be to just codify some uh, protections and requirements for non-conforming marijuana production premises. It's just adopting into the code some requirements of the state. Number 12 is similar that we're just adopting into the code some uh, language that is consistent with new state legislation regarding forest template dwellings. Um, number 13 is to codify some EFU replacement dwelling requirements. The state has new requirements for the replacement of lawfully established dwellings in the EFU district. The proposal is to simply adopt those new requirements in our code. Number 14 is to allow a uh, certain EFU non-conforming secondary school expansions. Uh, this is something that we're required to allow. So the proposal is to adopt the, uh, the state's language into our zoning code. 15 is to adopt uh, the state language related to small scale farm process actually recognize that that's an allowed use in the ag forest and EFU zones. And number 16 is similar in that we would adopt language into the zoning code explaining that farm breweries are an allowed use um, in the ag forest and EFU districts as well. 17 is to allow uh, according to the code, cideries in the ag forests and EFU districts as well, as already allowed under state law. 18 would be uh, to repeal the ADU owner occupancy requirement and the off street parking requirement in urban growth boundaries. So we're already not allowed by new state law to apply an owner occupancy requirement or require an additional off street parking space for ADUs inside of urban growth boundaries. And so we would be repealing those provisions from our zoning code. Number 19 is optional though. Uh, it's the proposal to uh, repeal the owner occupancy requirement for ADUs that are outside of urban growth boundaries, but in the MRR district up in the Mount Hood area. So the proposal is to just keep all of the owner occupancy requirements the same in the sense that we don't have any for any ADU but we would keep the off-street parking requirement for ADUs up in the Mount Hood area. 
Uh, number 20, the proposal is to repeal the owner occupancy requirement for use that are again similar to ADUs but outside of urban areas and just for these homes that are built between 1850 and 1945. Number 21 um, is a proposal to repeal the county's marijuana retailing operating hours. You recall that uh, we have a restriction on the operating hours for marijuana retailing, but we don't have restrictions on the operating hours for any other business in a commercial zone. The effect of this repeal would be not that they could operate at any hour of the day, but that it would just be up to the state's OLCC to decide what the operating hours are. Is there any interest? This was a significant issue, um, but I don't know if, if there's an interest in having more discussion. It sounded like at the last public hearing that there might have been some consensus among the group that uh, in favor of repealing the owner or the uh, operating hours. Okay. Uh, number 22 is a proposal to repeal all of the provisions in the comprehensive plan and the zoning code that relate to the campus industrial district because we don't have any more property with that zoning district and we cannot apply that zoning district in the future. So it's just sort of out there and we're proposing to take it all out of the text. Then there's just some uh, housekeeping amendments to zoning code sections related to the Ag, Forest, EFU, and Timber District. And those are detailed in the various summaries that come with those text amendments. And I did update those summaries in attachment E so that they reflect the additional amendments that I outlined at the beginning of tonight's presentation. And then finally, there's some other general housekeeping amendments just typos, errors, spacing issues, that kind of thing. Wonderful. Uh, so Jennifer, at this point, would it be appropriate to entertain a motion accepting all of the actions um, other than number three, number eight, and number 10? do do a, a vote and then move into addressing the final three with discussion and voting is that would that work yeah you can you can do that if you would, would like i think with a legislative amendment you can split it up that way so basically it would be a motion to recommend to the board approval of staff's recommendation of you know the package excluding numbers three eight and ten yeah. okay would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, move approval of staff's recommendation for proposed items one through 24 with the exclusion of uh, number three, eight, and 10. Do we have a second? I'll second it. <clears throat> Very good. All right, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, shall we, I believe it was requested that we do roll call votes when we're on Zoom. So Darcy, could you help us with that? Did we lose Darcy? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm right here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> trying to keep notes. You. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, Commissioner Peterson. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Stevens. Yes. Commissioner Pasco. Aye. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. I think we lost him. I think we lost him. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Commissioner Pack. Aye. Commissioner Schrodel. Yes, aye. Okay. Um, well, with the exception of Commissioner Wilson, I believe we have a unanimous uh, vote in favor. Darcy, is there a way to contact? He's back. Hey, He's there back. He is. <laughs> Commissioner Wilson? I'm back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Where did, where did you leave off? 
I don't know. <laughs> I went off into the uh, never never land of bits and bites. Ah, did you um did you hear the motion, Commissioner Wilson? No, I did not. Okay. Um, Commissioner Schrodel made the motion that we accept all of the staff's proposals on the 24 actions with the exception of number three, number eight, and number 10. And, um, oh man, I already lost it. Who did the second? I did. Peterson. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> and uh, everyone voted in favor. And are you prepared to vote on that motion or do you have further discussion? I'll be in favor of it. Okay, then I believe we have a unanimous vote with the quorum we have. Yes. Very good. Okay, very good. Is there so, an order that you want to take three, eight, and ten in, or? Anyone want to start with, with what they'd like to start with, or I don't care. I have a random comment that is not three, eight, or 10. <laughs> <Go ahead>. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> surprise, huh? <laughs> um, so Glenn, in your uh, proposed alterations for section 401.05C, that's page 401-15. Um, okay. Your uh, altered language removes the Oxford comma. And I am very much in favor of keeping the Oxford comma. <laughs> um, I find that it's much clearer in trying to interpret the code and more legally oh, enforceable. Uh -huh. So I would yes. recommend keeping the Oxford comma. <laughs> that, that actually is the preferred style officially in the ZDO, although there are still places we have not fixed it. So. What's the preferred style, keeping it or not using it? Keeping it. Okay. Keeping it, yes. Could you After give extensive me that? grammar research, we decided to keep it. <laughs> I, I just argued Gresham around to that too. So, um, so it's section 401.05C, the residential section that you got, that you were updating. Got it. Um, it's throughout that section, particularly got the, it. Uh, number one, had a few. Um, it, it, maybe this is up for some discussion, actually. I think in that case, I just took the exact wording from state law, um, leaving out the Oxford commas, and maybe we've gone back and forth sometimes. Uh, is there a preference in adopting exactly what state law said here or inserting our own Oxford commas? I think we can defer to Jennifer for that decision. <laughs> yeah, that does complicate things a bit. So how about if for these purposes, we just acknowledge that that's preferred and Glenn and I can circle back because I think maybe the state doesn't use it. Um, so it creates kind of this weird dichotomy. That's From my perspective, if we're citing state law, I think we should cite the state law, including the the the, the bad grammar, right? Yeah. <laughs> that just causes the potential for a problem if we don't yeah. share the exact same language. I think that's, I would agree with Brian with that. Well, I'm happy ours, to hear that. We'll use it. I'm happy to hear that that's the preferred method when it's, <laughs> when it's our code. It is. We will double check to make sure that uh, I didn't leave out an Oxford comma that the state used, then I would just be embarrassed. And that would probably count as a Scrivener's error, so you probably don't need our approval to make that change anyways. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. That's all my asides. Thank you. Appreciate it. We love you, Mary. <laughs> I love right. that Mary reads this stuff so preference? closely. Does anyone have a preference on which one we'd like to start with, or do we want to start with number three, um, just the uh, discussing the allowed manufacturing of goods retailed on site in commercial areas? We want to start there. I could just say a quick couple of words about what this is again for context, and then I'll back away um, and answer any questions that you might have. The proposal is uh, as staff has drafted it 
is to newly allow the manufacture of edible and drinkable products that are retailed on site, as well as allowing related wholesale distribution in the following zones, the C2 zone, the C3 zone, the CC zone, OC, RTC, and SCMU districts. And then on your screen is again that bulleted list of some examples of uh, around the county that have those zoning designations. Um, and then for further context, right now, no manufacturing of any kind is allowed in the C2 and RTC districts. The C2 district, that's the community commercial zone, kind of at the heart of the Oak Grove community. And RTC, that's the rural tourist commercial zone up in the Mount Hood area. So to be clear, no manufacturing of any kind is permitted in those zones today. Um, However, in the other commercial zones that are listed, you can do certain types of manufacturing already. It's just the code has this provision that it says, except for the primary processing of raw materials. So in those other zones today, you could do things like assemble in a, a painting easel that was discussed at the last hearing. You could put things together, but you might not be able to smelt iron ore. Um, and you could not, at least under our interpretation of the language, do things like the processing of hops, a raw material into beer. And so we would be expressly allowing uh, manufacturing, even when it involves the primary processing of raw materials, provided it's the manufacturing of edible and drinkable products that are retailed on site. Um, and so uh, since the last hearing, you'll see in the record, there was the letter from um, Ms. Wolf uh, regarding the historic downtown Oak Grove's interest in this measure. If I recall correctly from their letter, uh, they had some more discussion about this proposal since our last hearing. And they, at this time, aren't ready to recommend allowing the manufacturer of other items in the C2 or C3 zones um, that they're sort of concerned with of their community and are so far just now in support of allowing the manufacture of edible or drinkable products. Uh, but happy to answer any questions you might have. Glenn, do you want to review the comment we got today from Joseph Edge too? Sure. Yeah. Um, Let's see if I can actually even just pull it up. Commissioner Pasco, were you able to receive or find that? Um, oh, that was about the other memo though, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's about the other one, but I have it. I have, I found it in the packet and Jennifer sent it to me. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, yeah, just a moment and I'll pull it up on the screen. Okay, so um, Joseph Edge uh, sent today, and I believe that you uh, received a copy of it, some, um, uh, a document uh, made in place, small scale manufacturing in neighborhood revitalization. And it's sort of, I haven't read through it all myself, uh, but it sort of just talks about the benefits allow of allowing this type of use in the idea of placemaking. Um, so I'll add I, the sort of end of it was um, that there's kind of a, a new use category of an artisan manufacturing that would include smaller scale production like hand tool production of other type, types of goods that they might be interested in considering in the future. But at this point, they're still recommending um, and by they, he's the chair of the Oak Grove Community Council. Um, they're still recommending and requesting that we recommend approval of the staff's recommendation, but that we might want to consider in the future the, that artisanal manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that we had a discussion of that and that got brought up. So, uh, so is it fair to say that that's already approved in those other uh, zoning areas except for the one that applies to Oak Grove? 
Uh, well, Oak Grove is sort of interested in two zoning districts, the C2 zone and the C3 zone. The C2 right. zone being at the heart of Oak Grove and then the C3 zone being along McLaughlin Boulevard. Right. Already today in the C3 zone along McLaughlin Boulevard, you can do manufacturing as long as it doesn't involve the primary processing of raw materials. So, so, so it might be the assembly of tools or that kind of thing might be allowed in the C3 zone already today, um, just not in the C2 zone. Okay, I guess that's what I was clarifying. So <clears throat> some of these are already permitted. It just would apply to those two zones that they're not. So we have this kind of weird, <clears throat> weird uh, amendment where we'd add to these two specific types of manufacturing to two zones and these other zones, but all the other other uh, manufacturing type um, wouldn't change in the other zones. So you still have this anomaly where you have these two zones that are kind of one off from the rest of them, which I don't know, maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. But Well, those two zones are commercial zones. Yeah. And so that's why they're the exception that we're talking about today to allow the edible drinkable manufacturing. Right. No, I say, I'm, I know that, but what I'm saying is all the other zones that we're lumping in together with this, this additional um, also have other, allow other, other zones. So it's, these are only commercial only zones or aren't these other ones, other ones, partial commercial zones also? Are some of the other zones that are in there? They are, all six are commercial zones. There's only two of the six where no manufacturing is allowed today. Under the proposal, we would be expanding the allowed uses in all six zones. We would be allowing for the first time any kind of manufacturing right. in, the, in our TC districts and a new kind of manufacturing in the other districts. I understand that. I'm just, <clears throat> I think the question was whether, whether we should allow more than just those two. And uh, they weren't ready to allow more. But on the other hand, if all the rest of them allow more, why, why would these two continue to be the exception? I'll say the reason that I wanted to bring that conversation up of the allowing more uses and in particular what um, the community comment brought forward about the artisan manufacturing was that might be something we want to earmark for future discussion. But I think Glenn noted in our last meeting that adding more to this proposal would probably require a lot more research than we can do in just an amendment to staff's okay. proposal tonight. That, all right, yeah. I'll buy that. I'll, I'll, and I'll weigh in. I, I, I think that the, 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 the term artisan manufacturing was what we were all struggling with at the last meeting. I think it's really smart and it's really creative. And I, I think what, what we need to do now is put a clear definition, you know, on that, which we obviously can't do tonight. But I, I think it's a really creative, smart idea. And it's something that we should consider consider adding in the near future. I don't think it, I don't think it, people would find it controversial once we got a clear definition together for it. So I think the question for us then is, do we want to just make a motion that we ask staff to look into it, to keep it on the list, um, separate from the ZDO? Honestly, I would be support if, if this is up to the staff, but I, I I, to me, that concept is really clear and it wouldn't take that much to put a definition behind it and forward that to the, the county commission. Like I, would, I wouldn't have a, a problem, you know, deferring the staff to figure it out between now and when the county commission meets, because uh, I think it's a really great idea. But, uh, you know, it, if, if the staff feel uncomfortable with that, I understand that too. Yeah. Glenn, do you want to comment to that? Again, just to remind us of what you were talking about last time with the additional things you'd want to look into. Sure. Um, so uh, this topic is on the work program uh, because of the interests. I mean, I'll go out on a limb and say because of the interests of the Oak Grove community that has expressed this and representatives of them. And they have voiced so far that their interest has been in uh, breweries and bakeries. And so that's kind of what the background of the discussion up until this point had been. And that originally it was just for the community commercial areas, just the C2 and RTC districts. And then, you know, we, 
well, Oak Grove also uh, has responsibility over area zoned C3, so there was an interest in also including that zone eventually too. And then when we got around to uh, writing the amendments, it sort of became clear that, well, this is a type of use that we should allow in other commercial zones too, so the proposal got further. But at the heart of it was really uh, an attempt to figure out a way to allow breweries and bakeries and those kinds of things. We just haven't given a lot of thought to what might be the land use impacts of the manufacturer of other goods and reaching out to communities that represent these zones to find out if they'd be okay with it. Um, we're not sure uh, what language we would have to apply to make sure that it doesn't include the manufacture of things that people would not want to see along McLaughlin Corridor? Would they be okay with cement manufacturing, for example, as long as some cement is retailed on site? Or coming up with the definition of artisan might take some wordsmithing to make sure that it's clear and objective for staff so that we can say when people ask, yes, this is allowed or it's not. I don't know if we could do that between now and you know when the packets need to go out to the board. Um, ahead of their hearing. I'll just add that there is a um, starting uh, definition for artisan manufacturing that, that was in the public comment from the city of Nashville zoning ordinance. So that's a starting place. Um, but as much as I would like to see that, I do tend to agree with staff that it might need a little bit more research and outreach than is what's left in the process for this particular project. So I'd personally like to see it left on the work plan to look into, but I don't necessarily think that there's enough public process left in this ZDO amendment to include it now. I agree. I, I am, you know, the reality is that, you know, this is our last chance for a while probably to amend this particular component, but, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's an option to put it on the work plan for next year. We'll see. <laughs> But I, I agree, it's just to, you know, we just need to call it good for now. I did have a concern, and that was uh, in government camp, if C2 changes, we're going to have manufacturing next to residential zones. So that is something that I would question. And number two is the infrastructure able to handle the manufacturing that it's going to be taking on. Murph, is that particularly related to the edible, drinkable products we're talking about now or with extending that to the further artisan manufacturing? That, to the further. To the yeah. further. Okay, so that's one of the questions we'd want to keep on the list for looking into I it. I haven't spoken until now, so yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I think that's, I mean, I'm look, one of the areas is out by my house and the uh, that zone is next to residential areas as well. So, I mean, I, I'm guessing you'd have that potential with all of those uh, zones where they are near residential areas. So that issue is something that would, you would encounter regardless. Yes. I mean, it's not unique, it's not unique to, to years, to your area, I don't think. And so if that's an, if that's a concern not to do it, then I guess you'd, you'd want to rethink that, that whole uh, concept. <clears throat> Obviously the Oak Grove folks, areas in a residential zone they want it so you know do we have any further discussion on what's being proposed here any other questions concerns we received quite a bit of information on it uh you know even additional information so any further from any of the commissioners well uh how about a motion uh so i'd move that we recommend adoption of the amendments for item number three on staff's list based on staff's recommendations, but that we would also request that staff look into inclusion of artisanal manufacturing on and keep that on the work plan. Very good. Do we have a second? I'll second. Great. Thanks, Tom. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, Darcy, could you give us a roll call, please? Okay, <clears throat> Commissioner Peterson. Yes. Stevens. Yes. Pasco. 
Aye. Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. Wilson. Yes. Pack. Aye. Schrodel. Aye. Unanimous. Looks like we have a unanimous vote in favor. Wonderful. Thank you all. Okay. Shall we stay in line and just go on to number eight, Glenn? Sounds good. Great. Uh, that would be the philo topic. And I'll just bring up this uh, slide here. So uh, this, again, is the proposal to expand the opportunities for which a fee can be paid in lieu of a developer themselves constructing certain required frontage improvements. They would pay a fee to the county instead, and then that fee would go into a pot of money that could be then spent on uh, pedestrian improvements inside the Portland Metro urban growth boundary. And Karen Burig had responded to some questions in uh, the memo that should be in your packet. Um, the proposal, just to kind of boil it down to what it is, uh, is one, here's what it would change. It would allow Philo to be paid on any road type in the Portland Metro UGB. So this time now, including things like uh, arterial streets when it didn't before. Um, it would also allow Philo to be paid when there are public storm drainage constraints. So if a sidewalk that would otherwise on paper be required to be constructed would present itself some uh, storm drainage constraints, then the amendments would allow the developer to pay a fee in lieu of those uh, improvements instead. And then it would allow um, in a situation when there, uh, allow Philo to be paid when there is a hundred feet or less of frontage uh, involved and there is no existing sidewalk or pathway that those frontage improvements would connect to. So if the frontage is less than a hundred feet and it wouldn't connect into anything, this proposal would allow somebody to pay philo uh, instead of constructing it. Um, the 200 foot requirement that, discussed, that got discussed at the last hearing um, we're just moving that provision from one section of the code down to lower in the list. We're not proposing to change it. It's already the requirement that uh, there's already the allowance for uh, Hilo when there is not any uh, road section within 200 feet. But if it is um, further than 200 feet, this option would allow more properties to pay Philo if they have less than 100 foot of frontage and it wouldn't connect to anything. Um, but Ken Kent might be able to answer further questions, but I'll just turn it over to the commission uh, to hear what questions you might have. I don't know that I have a question, but I, I'll just, you know, um, just express my my reservation and my concern around all this, right? Which is, you know, I, I totally understand the benefits of Philo. My biggest concern is that this basically allows, you know, a project to go in, in that's going on in Damascus to use that money to pay for some sidewalk in Wilsonville. And that we've got this policy in place that is ultimately driven by um, a po politics and funding for other projects, which would in many ways dictate where this money might spend and be spent, right? And, uh, you know, the concept I get, I, I just uh, continue to be kind of uncomfortable with the lack of process and procedure and clarity around where this money can be spent and how close to the initial projects and that it can be spent in a, an entirely different community from where a particular project is going on. That, that's fundamentally my concern around all of this. So Brian, you might want to keep it in the same zip code, so to speak. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I haven't thought through how you would actually define it. I don't know that that's my role, but it's the concept that if, if money is being spent, if, uh, you know, if, if a developer is being 
given the option to pay money to in lieu of doing this type of work that that money ought to be spent in the community that is you know getting the burden of not having that extra facility right, right. whatever that looks like Well, that makes. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. I have a question, Glenn. Looking at your diagram, I see where um, the sidewalk um, is required for Section A, but not for Section B. Now, if the sidewalk goes in on Section A, does that mean? that B is now next to a sidewalk and it has to put in a sidewalk? Uh, I, maybe I'm confusing this and making it uh, more complicated than it should be. Uh, I might, uh, this isn't my diagram actually, uh, but Ken, do you have this diagram in front of you or you might be able to see it on the screen? I interpret the diagram to mean that right now under the current provisions, um, Philo would not be an option for certain lots um, and that the, pro that the proposal would allow Philo to be paid on other lots. A would not be allowed to pay Philo because it's frontage, there is a sidewalk within 200 feet, it's right next to it. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Ken, do you want to talk about the diagram? So they'd have to put a sidewalk in A, right? And then B Correct. would be next to a sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. So, so it wouldn't be excluded again. It depends on who constructs the sidewalk first. So Correct. If, if A constructs their sidewalk before B comes in for development, then B would have to pay Philo. Um, but if B comes in for development uh, before A does, then under the proposal, B would have the opportunity to pay Philo. So it's a matter of timing. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, di the diagram just represents a snapshot in time. And as more sidewalks are, conduct are constructed in the county, fewer people would qualify over time, but it's so incremental. <laughs> you know, but theoretically over time, that number of people that qualify will drop because there'll be sidewalks in more places. And, and that money that uh, was put aside for the philo uh, wouldn't be available to put in the sidewalk in B, would it? Is that, is that a, some kind of a escrow fund or is it just gonna be used anywhere? So, and I'm happy, to, I can't see Ken on my screen at the moment, but um, I'm happy to defer if Ken wants to jump in here, but they wouldn't use Philo money to build, well, they could theoretically close a gap someplace. So I'm not saying it could never be used on the street that's shown here, but typically what has happened is that they have been building projects in areas that are likely to have, um, I guess what you might call a more broad-based community benefit. So near schools or community facilities, and the reality is we've had Philo for about 15 years and I think they've built three projects. This money is not accruing at a rapid rate because there's just not a ton of development that ends up paying it. Can I ask a question? So last time we had this discussion, I started out my conversation with the statement that I'm a huge fan of Fee and Lou, but I also followed that up with the the notion that you have to price these appropriately. The fact that you've had these in place for 15 years and you've only done five projects leads me to believe that they're not priced in a way that really provides the benefit and the, uh, for the program that it was intended for. And also, as I was reading through um, Karen's email or uh, memo, I was troubled by some of the things that mentioned and that is, um, you know, there are no specific criteria that we use apparently to find when these are uh, these projects wh who can you know use the philo instead of actually meeting the development requirements and uh, i think it's important for us to understand what the objectives are 
and how the pro program um, is implemented. And I agree with Brian that it's not our role as the commissioners to come up with the, all of the recipes for, you know, how the program gets implemented. But I think given a program objective, you're going to want to have some level of um, criteria defined so that you're not making arbitrary decisions and that you're, you know, not only pricing it appropriately to meet your objectives, but also you have to have some level of um, time frame for which the project, the dollars get used. So you're not going to be collecting small pots of money. And then because it's not big enough pot of money, you're not going to be able to do anything. So you end up just sitting on it and you don't get the benefit of the infrastructure. And you also don't get the benefit of economies of scale, again, because you didn't price it right. So those are the kind of, the, I, mean, I really am a fan of fee, fee and loop, but it needs to be designed in a way that meets your objective. And it starts with the program's objective. I don't know what the objectives are. If it is truly to implement it to, for um, pet facilities for school, then we need to, I think as a, as a county, identify what those projects are and make sure that the funds are collected and goes to those objectives to meet the program. So those, those are just some things that I, and I, I guess I didn't realize that the, the FILO would be available for any road in Metro UGV, um, including arterials. I, I find that to be a little bit also troubling because I think some of the bigger projects um, paying fee in lieu, um, if it's cheaper to pay fee in lieu as opposed to actually meet the development standards, again, that tells me that the, the funds are not necessarily um, priced right. So those are my comments. Thank you. Um, to, to Brian's concern, I have a question. Does the county collect the <clears throat> SDCs in any form in, in yes. new developments? Huh? Yes. And so how, how are those uh, funds then allocated um, throughout the county, because it's the same dilemma. You have SDCs being collected, say out in uh, my area in Sunnyside, but I, do those SDCs necessarily go back into projects in, in my area, or do they end up everywhere, anywhere? So, hey, Glenn, could you stop screen sharing so I can see sure. everybody at once for a little yeah. bit? Thank yeah. you. Um, so, sorry, it just makes it easier to have the conversation. Sure. So, Ken, do you have, I know this much about SDCs, um, so I'm happy to have you tackle that. Yes, we collect a transportation SDC. Um, there used to be two districts, uh, one that was a joint Happy Valley Clackamas County District in your area, Tom, mm -hmm. um, and then one that was sort of the rest of the county. Um, for a long time, the SDC was paying for the rather substantial improvements that were made to Sunnyside Road. I think that there's no longer two districts. Ken, is that your understanding as well? Yeah. My understanding, I'm not involved in the SDC as much, but okay. um, I mean, I think that funding source is something that I think in Karen Burig's memo talks about that we would look at SDC funds. Uh, you'd have SDC funds for CIP projects. You'd have the FILO funds. And I think we're looking at matching funds. I know you mentioned that, um, the pot of money may not be very large. So it's some of the projects aren't just solely funded by Philo. They may look at other matching funds. It's a lot of it's driven by the projects that are on our essential pedestrian network. And a lot of those are looking for infill to provide con connections to schools and parks, et cetera, or where there are gaps or needs in various communities. Um, I think part of the challenge with the amount of money is the FILO was adopted in 2008 at a time when the economy was not doing very well with construction. And they've got quite a few years with very little fee and lieu. Um, and so it's, I think there's been more funds recently as development has increased over the last few years. Uh, but it, it is a slower process. Um, I think the pricing is, I mean, it comes down to a policy issue. Most of the estimates for philo are really looking to try and get what would the cost of those improvements on a particular frontage and we're looking at how much if you have to widen a particular road four to six feet build a curb sidewalk landscape strip that is what the philo fee would cover on that frontage but what we don't know is when we build a project somewhere else there are going to be different you know elements 
you know, maybe a wider road narrower. So there's, you know, the intent is to at least capture as close to the actual cost on that frontage. Um, but part of the challenges we have also is, I think is one of the items we mentioned was storm drainage is, um, you know, how can we capture that? Because some front, some developments, there's no frontage on the, in the area. That's one of the main reasons, you know, we've looked at fee and lieu if you build a curb, there's no, and there's no storm drainage, it becomes a real challenge uh, to actually construct it. So fee and lieu may make sense there. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the things that we mentioned in the memo that staff would, would look at is including some additional funds that cover the cost of a sort of a standard or a typical storm drainage along a frontage or so capturing more of the costs. Yeah, I guess, I guess in thinking about uh, some of the comments, I'm gonna, I, I'm kind of in line with Carrie one that they probably aren't priced adequately uh, because they're not priced based on what the county has to pay to get it done versus what a developer. So I, I would agree that there ought to be some some way to make sure that the numbers that you collect are numbers that will actually do do the equivalent in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I, I think I, I'm kind of in the mindset there, there, there must be a list of uh, county related projects, storm improvement projects, sidewalk improvement projects uh, for the for the for the entire county. <clears throat> and I think it would be useful to maybe kind of divide up the in the zones, kind of like Jennifer alluded to with how they did with the transportation SDCs, so that that uh, those communities then feel like there's some equity in how this money then gets spent. Now I recognize that may mean it may take longer <laughs> for some of these projects to get done because you can't pull them all and, and take from, include, uh, accomplish something in their area. But it does seem like a little more equitable approach for the various um, communities that are gonna benefit from the, the improvements or, or who have been paying into them and nothing's happening. Nothing comes back in return. So um, that's a thought. I don't know. I'm not sure how you write that into the into the proposed amendment, or it might be a recommendation, side recommendation that we submit. Uh, you know, if we if we decide to go ahead and approve this um, this item, those are my thoughts. You know, I, I, I'll just kind of dovetail on that. I, I could get behind something like, you know, the money gets spent on safe routes of school things, right? I think the problem that I see is that that's not written anywhere, right? The, the current policy is basically it gets decided by whoever happens to be in the room and, and whoever is hired on staff at a particular given time. There's no, there's no guidelines, there's no requirements behind that. And I think if, if, if you want us to really seriously consider a philo, I think it has to be coupled with some guidelines and some, some, some other funding policies around that. So if I could just offer a couple comments um, in response to what I've heard already before we get too far down the road and I forget to circle back. Um, the ZDO would not be the appropriate place to start you know, talking. In fact, for a while, the fee was in the ZDO, which made no sense because that's not where fees go. So we pulled that out and it's in the fee schedule, the county fee schedule now, so it can be updated easily and regularly if it needs to be, but they've gone to this engineer's cost estimate anyway. For a while, it was a linear foot, and that probably was not capturing the, you know, the actual cost. So I think it's better now than it was. Um, but this whole idea of having, you know, criteria and how you decide where you spend the money and all of that really isn't a logical fit for the zoning ordinance. But I understand your concerns um, about having something. So all I can tell you is that the transportation planning group has has it on their sort of list, their their work program, if you will. Um, to come up with specific criteria that would be, you know, presumably in writing someplace about how they guide where they spend this money. But thus far, it's been this either, you know, connecting priority segments where you've got a gap, like the one that was done in Sunnyside Village, um, or it's tied to the safe routes to school sort of community benefit um, issue but I can't offer you that there's anything formal in writing. And so if that's something that you want, you know, obviously you can move that we do that. You can 
move that you were really only in favor of phyllo or expanding, we already have phyllo, but expanding phyllo in if they develop something like that, I mean, you have a number of options available to you. Um, the question about why not more projects, the reality is, and Ken can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of projects build sidewalks. So it isn't as though the phyllo is happening on every development. If somebody's putting in a new subdivision, they're building a street, they're building a sidewalk, they're not paying phyllo. So a lot of our development doesn't qualify for phyllo, or they might for their own purposes choose not to pay it and to do the improvements on their own frontage. So the pot of money is not reflective of how much development we've had since phyllo came about. It's just how many of these kind of one-off little sort of infill things have occurred where it's been to the applicant's benefit um, and they've qualified to do phyllo. And there was a question about why, and again, I wasn't involved in this project. I do remember when the code amendments were done, but I think the idea was that we were finding that people were building sidewalks to nowhere all over the county. And I realized, yeah, if you don't start somewhere, you never finish it. But because of the nature of these sort of, you might get a two lot partition in one place, and there might be no other redevelopment potential on that, on that entire road. So that's it. You have one little segment of sidewalk and it will never be done. And the odds of the county picking that local street someplace to do with the, the lack of funding we have for sidewalks, pretty low. You know, we tend to put our projects in places that have bigger impact. So roads with higher classifications or roads that serve certain community uses. And so there was a feeling that it didn't necessarily make a lot of sense to be devoting resources of any kind to putting in these little sidewalk segments. Um, and that was really where this philo was born, you know, again, 12, 15 years ago. But I think the comments that you're making about having a process um, to decide how to spend it are, are really good ones. And I think there is an awareness that we need it. But again, it's one of those, okay, is it going to make it to the top of the list? And I think we can definitely convey that what we've heard tonight is that it should make it to the top of the list and that at least the Planning Commission feels very strongly that um, that, that needs to happen. So. Yeah, but, I mean, honestly, that's my concern, right? It will never make it to the top of the list, very rarely, right? Unless we say we're not going to move this forward until there's a clear policy in place. I agree, it doesn't belong in the ZDO, it, it, you know, but but it needs to exist for us to feel comfortable moving something, for me to feel comfortable moving something like this forward. You know, the result is that the, the communities that get these sidewalks are the communities that, you know, are well funded and have or you know have some political motivation to get those things done and the communities that don't have sidewalks or the less populated areas in the county or or for whatever reason there isn't as much drive and i, I don't think that's really equitable for the way we should be doing business so i have a clarifying question to ask of ken and then another comment to make along those lines um so ken after reading the memo that we got on this. I still have one question about when and how exactly a developer will elect to use the philo. Is it really up to the developer to decide if they're going to do it or not? Or is there a process where they have to get approval from your team to do the philo? Um, it is an approval from essentially our team. I mean, the language says that if the Department of Transportation, which is typically engineering and planning, reviewing an application together determines it's an acceptable alternative to constructing, then, you know, we would recommend the fee in lieu of, or at least provide that option. So it's okay. you know, evaluating all those criteria and looking at this in the same, um, with those same issues of, you know, there's no sidewalks in the vicinity or storm drainage, or there's significant topographical constraints. And so, you know, philo is, um, a reasonable alternative. So the code link, the draft code language for the updates that Glenn provided us sounded like if the development meets the prerequisites in the code that they can elect to use Philo, but you're saying there actually is a process where development planning and transportation has to agree? Um, yes. I mean, it's I mean, it's in the language that we, it's a reasonable alternative for one of the reasons that was listed. Okay. okay. I have another question here. Uh, who has been lobbying for this um, change? 
has it been the contractors or who's who's pushing for this expansion? Um, initially, it was yeah, it was really staff. Um, there are a number of issues we run across. Um, the diagram we looked at that showed the various um, sidewalk segments being in close proximity is almost in reality the opposite of what we usually face. Um, we usually have long segments of road with no sidewalks at all and then maybe one short section. So um, we're faced with that scenario. Um, the storm drainage is probably one of the bigger items because we have, even on arterial roads, we'll have a small partition and there's no storm drain pipe anywhere. And if we require that developer to try and construct sidewalk and curve, they have to handle their stormwater somehow. It's either connecting pipe 300 feet down the road or trying to then deal with infiltration on site or provide some pond of some sort um, in order to build that. Um, I think we were also seeing that with the current language, it wasn't applicable to arterial roads. And we do have quite a bit of small partitions that occur on, for example, River Road or Oatfield Road. And there are topographical constraints and often storm drainage can be limited. And so there were many cases where it was made a lot more sense to take a fee in lieu of than rather try and construct a small segment of the sidewalk that may or not be in alignment with whatever future project we'd ever construct on that road. Um, and so, you know, that's really what was driving it. Just as we've been implementing fee and lube over the last few years, these are some of the issues that have come up. And so we're looking at ways to uh, sort of address those issues. I think one of the other factors is the narrow frontage. Um, why, we, why we were looking at frontage that's less than 100 feet is just, for one, that's a sh very short section that may not be usable also with recent changes in ADA compliance, it's much more difficult to provide a ADA access from a sidewalk back down to the street it requires a, a concrete um, curb ramp. So if you have a small section of sidewalk with a driveway, then you have to construct a ramp. It's very challenging for the developer, um, particularly when you're not connecting to anywhere else. It's just a short section of sidewalk. So that's really what was driving these um, these changes to the code and sort of clarif clarifying how things have been operating and um, so, so what I'm hearing is that uh, the county staff is somewhat supportive of this is that correct yes okay. you, mentioned, you mentioned farm water many times and last time it, I brought it up uh, I brought up vegetated weirs uh, added mm -hmm. uh, within the phylo. Uh, so either be structural BMPs or uh, swales of some sort in these areas that are challenging. Uh, I personally would think that uh, if you're adding more permeable surface, you should be having some way to absorb and remove these toxins and allow ground water back into the ground. And this is the cheapest way other than I mean, by far cheaper and better for the environment than shoving it down a pipe. Um, so I would highly recommend that the county at this time, if we're looking at this, to, to start looking at structural BMPs, vegetated uh, swales or uh, vegetated weirs of some sort be added in the, in the curb and between the sidewalk. Um, I, I have a a thought. Um, so if this is predominantly an issue on roads and areas where there are likelihood of there never ever being another sidewalk constructed, why is there, and, in, and the stormwater implications uh, can't be achieved, why can't they just be exempt? Why collect a fee? Because there's no way that money's ever going to go back to that area. Um, and so it kind of gets to what Brian was saying. Essentially, you've just found a funding source to fund out a project somewhere else. I think that's a that's a philosophical question. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know, but I mean, I, it's it's more of a logical one from my perspective. It's an example of where you have a code that doesn't always work everywhere, 
And so you're trying to figure out a way to compensate for the fact that the code doesn't work. And now you're just using it as a way to generate money uh, to fund other projects. So, I mean, someone, someone could argue that's essentially what you're doing. So well, I, I think, think there, there, sorry, go there, ahead. there are regulations that you have to meet. Um, so you can't just, because it's expensive and because, you know, it, um, it may not be um, the, the most easy way to develop it. Uh, you, you can't just waive these requirements. Um, some, especially with stormwater issues, they're required by federal regulations. So it's not something that we can, we can just I, not do. I get that, but he mentioned a, a road that doesn't have any stormwater collection uh, in, the, in the, the way it would if it had sidewalks and, and roads. And if you're only, and you have one little piece of property that now has to, and the likelihood of any of the rest of the properties on that road ever making improvements would ultimately then lead to these long-term stormwater improvements. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think that's, um, that, that goes to, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know the um, Clackamas County stormwater codes as well as some of the other ones that I've yeah. been involved with, but that goes to um, Commissioner Murphy's comment of how you meet some of these requirements. You don't always have to build um, pipes and ponds to meet the stormwater regulations. You can probably have small swales, vegetative swales in a ditch line for that matter, um, next to the projects that may, you know, be in rural, somewhat of a rural area where other properties may never develop next to your property. So it's not whether you, whether you do it or don't do it, it's matter of how you do it that makes more, uh, I think, the difference to the to the development, but again, I don't have the expertise in um, Clackamas County um, development codes yet, um, so I can't really opine on that too much. Um, so maybe I just wanted to point out that Stephen has his hand up next, so thanks, thanks, Karen. So yeah. I'm kind of going back to so we have this thing called the Unified Building Code, and architectural projects or development projects have to you know meet the development code. Uh, depending on what year it's been designed. And Clackamas County is a large county and has uh, a lot of existing projects that are already done, but anything that's new would have to follow the UBC. And when we talk about drainage or runoff or that, there are options for what they can and can do. Now, I used to be an intern architect. I left it a long time ago, so I'm this is vintage information. Uh, but I can't imagine that any new project uh, that is a sizable housing division is not going to have sidewalks or I'm not interested in what the, the developers costs are because they're being passed along to the home buyers of that development and if they don't have sidewalks then it's going to have one price point if it does have sidewalks it's going to have a different price point but I feel like that's going down a rabbit hole uh, my final question to uh, Ken and Jennifer is if this funds goes over to transportation, what public oversight is going to take place for these funds that will have matching grant funds and other funds uh, to actually know where this money is getting spent to improve our community? Mary, your hands up. I'll lower my little virtual hand. Yeah. Um, let me lower my hand before I forget. Um, so it sounds like we could discuss this for a long time, but in general, it sounds like we don't necessarily have any issues with staff's proposal. We have a lot of questions about the Philo system as a whole. So I just want to throw it out there that I think it sounds like we might be good to go with recommending approval of staff's recommendation, but also putting in a planning commission recommendation that the county work on developing guidelines for the use of the, the philo funds in particular looking at an equitable an equitable distribution of the use of those funds as well as what kind of public oversight might be involved in that i'm not sure that i'm i'm there um, okay. and i i will just say honestly like i feel like this proposal proposal has been put forward 
because it is creating some convenience around the county staff and developers. And, that, and that's not meant derogatively. I think that's, that's a legitimate reason to do this. But I think what's come out of this is some also legitimate concerns about the lack of process and policy around it. And I haven't heard anything around any type of urgency here, right? And so personally, I would rather come back and look at this six months, 12 months, whatever it takes, when people have actually thought through this propo proposal in a meaningful way and that we can consider it. And I, I just, I've been around this county long enough to know that if we move something through, it, it, it might be years before a policy ever gets in place around this stuff, right? And, and I don't, I'm just not a big fan of moving, making a decision like this without having the thought behind it, hope, hoping that we'll get to it after the fact. That, that's just where I'm at on this for what it's worth. I don't see any other hands. Any other comments? I just ask then it sounds like what we want to decide is if we want to include moving this forward with a recommendation to look at to actually pursue and do those guidelines or if we want to recommend that it's um, dependent upon doing those guidelines. And, and when you say that, Mary, do you mean you'd recommend approval, but the guidelines would have to be there first? But I mean, isn't that in a sense saying we don't want to recommend this until they're, I mean, don't even move it forward because the guidelines aren't going to happen that quickly. Right. I, I think that would, we'd have to figure out exactly how we want to phrase that and maybe staff can help us with that. It might be that we don't recommend approval on that one, but include the comment that we would if we could see those guidelines or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While we all think about that, could we take a five minute break? Okay, great. I'll see you all back here at uh, eight o'clock. Oh, there it's over in the there it is. Okay, great. All right, we're reconvening, and oh, we've got two hands up, and I believe that the first one up was uh, Mary. I just had a quick question of staff. If we're looking at holding off on the um, philo amendments in the code until we can see a philo policy, when would the next project that's amending the ZDO be that that might be included in? Um, the, the next phase of the ZDO audit, you may remember the ZDO audit. It seems almost like a myth now that we might eventually go back to working on that. Um, but we do actually have another phase of the audit that's supposed to happen in the current two-year work program. And so I expect that one's going to start working on that um, early in the fall. Um, so, and, one th and the, the, actually the section that Philo is part of still needs to be audited. So we could consider it at that point. I mean, obviously procedurally right now, you're making a recommendation to the board. They could still adopt this as is. I mean, it's out there, but you know, they, they certainly give weight to your recommendations, so they might not. And so then the next thing would be, yeah, would be the audit. And the other question for staff is, do you have any, um, uh, estimate as to the amount of development that might not be included in the philo option in those next two years if we don't approve it now? I couldn't begin to quantify that. Could you, Ken? <laughs> I don't think so. It's hard to say because um, uh, we're you know, there's still a number of projects that are collecting philo. I think it, you may have opened a few more with um, using it on the arterials. But yeah, it really just depends on development. And we are limiting, you know, it is limited to partitions and then I believe duplexes. So it's sort of a limited group of projects that even apply or qualify for philo. Okay, uh, Brian, did you have a question? Well, I, I'll piggyback on Mary's question first, which is, would we actually would we really have to wait until another audit to take something like this up when it's basically already gone through a staff process? 
I mean, we could take this up at any time, right? Well, so it's not another audit. It's the next phase of the current audit. It's on the adopted work program right now to do the next phase of the, of the audit. So that's the next project we're gonna start after this one is the audit. Right. Is the but, next phase of the audit. So could you just take it up? Well, I mean, the problem is procedurally, we still have to start over. I mean, we have to go back, do another notice to DLCD, et cetera, you know, unless we just somehow hold this and not send it to the board and just, which would be a little bit interesting. I'm not quite sure how that would play out. I mean, I guess conceivably we would be sort of severing the project and having part of it stay with you and the rest go on to the board for their August 5th hearing. Um, so right. anyway, and clearly there's more staff work that has to happen. I mean, I, Right. The staff that's going to do this work isn't even in land use planning. So I, <laughs> I can't really speculate as to when they may be able to come up with a program and what that would look like and what sort of, like you're saying, public oversight. I mean, there's a... And that's part of my concern, committee. right? Like, <laughs> well, you know, like a, I mean, they have a committee. Uh, there right. is a pedestrian and bikeway committee, and there's certainly public oversight of the expenditure of county funds. Right. But it's not my staff that would be doing that work. So I can't really commit them. All I can say is we can go and have that conversation with. And as a result, our, our, our commission doesn't have any oversight over them. Right. And, you know, and I, I totally get the idea of like not holding this stuff up, but um, you know, at the same time, like, I don't want to vote yes or no on this. I, I think more work needs to be done and I'd like to just, pull it out and, and take it up when it's actually ready. And I don't, personally, I just don't feel like it is. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really think, you know, the reality is it seems kind of small, but it, you know, there, there could be increase in fees at any point. Maybe we start getting a whole bunch more development projects in the county when the economy improves. The impacts could be significant over time. And I don't, I don't think it's right to just kind of lapse over the policy considerations just because we have a, a deadline and want to move something through. Mm -hmm. I, I totally understand if others, you know, feel like we need to move this forward. I, I get that. I, I just, I'm not sure that I'm there. I mean, I think if you make a recommendation that staff just sim simply withdraws this part of the proposal effectively, I can take that back to where, you know, we can just decide to do that, but I'm not prepared to make that call tonight because yeah. it didn't come from my department, the right. request to do this. So yeah. I have to I mean, if, kind if, of if find it was out. my call, right, and you know, if I was the only person on the commission, I, I personally would move to to remove the this policy from the packet and come back and revisit it later. Right. Um, I understand the challenges behind doing that though. And so conceivably we can do that this the current fiscal year we could we would have a package we could bring it back in i just have to figure out who's going to do the work as far as the coming up with this process and all that because that's not in my department tom you had a question uh yeah um so uh, has uh, the commission had a work uh, session on this on these yet the commissioners so they are so yeah. they're all they're already aware of this this uh recommendation so I'm well, curious. Huh? Yes no. and no. So um, we, Glenn and I did have a policy session at the board before we ever kicked off the, um, kicked off this project. But right. what we highlighted were what we construed to be the significant issues. They got all the materials. I mean, yeah. Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong, but there wasn't a draft at that point. They didn't get the volume of material that you've seen in these last two hearings. It okay. was, like it was back when you had your study sessions in the winter. And what we highlighted were the, the, um, the key, the small scale manufacturing, that you know, the, the kennel setbacks, the things that had been specifically called out right. in the work program. And that's what they talked about. So they did not have any debate or discussion about Philo because quite frankly, staff didn't really identify that the Philo issue was gonna rise to the level that it has. Okay. You know, we considered these because we already have a philo program and it's been operating so we saw these as relatively modest changes to a program that's been operational for 12 or 15 years so we didn't we just didn't realize you didn't think about the fact that i was on the commission jennifer yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know this was your yeah that this was your passion and i 
side. I don't have. Did, any I, did I hear correctly though this. that? Did, did I hear you correctly that realistically, if this was delayed, it could still come back to this commission within this calendar year? Within this fiscal year, this fiscal I can't year. promise it would be back before December, because okay. we have a, a lot of work to do on the next code package. So I wouldn't anticipate hearings happening before the next calendar year. Right. It might come back for a work session. I mean, practically, that that's six months away, right? Mm -hmm. I don't personally think that's a lot of time to go back and rethink some of the stuff and, and get it right the first time. For what it's worth. <laughs> Mary? So I two things. One, I think it might be worth just a quick straw poll to see how the other commissioners besides Brian and myself feel about this one. <laughs> um, and two, I think I'm okay relying on staff, the staff who administer this to know that this was actually a minor change to what they're already doing, but to find some way for us to continue to push for that policy. So it might be that we continue to ask staff at every meeting if this is on the work plan and if this is happening and when we can see it again. Um, but I'd say since I, I could lean on the staff who administer this and recommended the changes to it in order to let the policy move forward now personally, but would like to hear other commissioners comments and how they feel about that now. Carrie, would you like to share your thoughts? Well, I was thinking the exact opposite for the same reasons because it is already a policy that exists. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to fix it, whatever needs to be fixed. Why not hold off um, pushing through the policy until we have better ideas on how we could implement this program. So I'm at this, you know, I started in the same logic as you, uh, Mary, and ended up at the exact opposite place. And Tom, how are you feeling? I'm kind of on the fence. I could, I could uh, go either way. I'm, I'm okay with uh, sending it on with a recommendation that the policies get developed and that, that I don't know if we can establish a, a date, like, can you get, get back to us within a year? So there's, it, it, we know what's going to happen, but I don't know if that's feasible, but I could also wait too. So I, I'm not, I don't have a real strong opinion one way or the other. And Michael, how are you feeling? I'm okay with the way the thing is written right now. I'm, we're going forward with it and getting it off the books and letting this, um, the um, procedure be done. Okay, thank you. And Murph, what are your thoughts? It, I say fix it. Let's hang on to it and fix it. It should be right. And I, I'm not going to pass something just because. I, I think it needs to be updated and uh, we need to make it clear. Uh, I've heard from contractors before about it. Uh, this is something that needs to be fixed, definitely. And Stephen? I'm in favor of passing things that are completed and uh, a lot of times things, something else could come up and, and then we just wouldn't get back to getting it done. So I guess I'm going to, I was trying to go very simple and short, but then Murphy stole, stole <laughs> by just saying fix it. So, so fix. <laughs> um, and my feelings, I, I'm just kind of on both sides of that fence. I'm with Tom on that. I can see going one way or the other. Uh, my preference is definitely send a quality product through to the board. Um, so I, I think I would lean more to making, making sure the policy is right and in place before we forward it. So I'm leaning heavier that way. Does that help? I think there's enough of us on the fence or leaning in the direction of making sure the policy is in place before we make a change that I'd be comfortable making a motion in that direction um, because the policy is important and if enough of the commissioner sounds like it feels like we want that in place even though a lot of us did express that we'd be okay with the amendments going forward I think I'd be comfortable making the motion to pull it from the recommendations until a policy is developed for how the philo funds are to be used. I will second. Was that a motion, Mary? 
I think so, yeah. <laughs> and I seconded it. <laughs> and, and seconded. Uh, seconded. I'm sorry, Mary, Mary, can you actually state your motion, please? Yeah, so I'd move to pull item eight for the amendments to the philo policy in the ZDO from the package of amendments until a policy for guidelines for the use of the philo funds can be put into place that with the policy to include addressing the equitable distribution of the use of the funds and some public oversight. Would you like to second that, Brian? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? Question? Yes. Kind uh, kind of goes back to um, how the commission might act on this. If we if we pr approve this um, amendment, is the county then not presented to the commission, or they just present the findings of what we uh, recommend? How does this work? I mean, I guess what I'm what, what questioning is, will it really stop it or will it just send a stronger message to the commissioners? Uh, we don't want it to move forward without the policy in place. So I think, I think we're ultimately making a recommendation to the county commission that it be pulled, right? They've already, they've seen the proposal. This is going to be, you know, it, it will be part of what they were reviewing. And, and I would just, you know, if we pass this motion, I would just ask the staff to make it clear to the commission that we felt this piece should be pulled out for the time being and brought back. Yeah. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. All right. I mean, I, I do think procedurally staff could pull it if we wanted to. Yes. And I don't have a problem with waiting, but I need to circle back with the people who wanted to, you know, I mean, Ken works partly in that department, but I, you know, or he does. There's also another department involved that Karen Beerig manages. Um, so I need to circle back and find out if everyone's okay with waiting, because if so, then I think we can just pull it. I mean, it's a legislative amendment. There's no obligation that we take it forward. So we could just do that. But I can't commit to you for sure tonight that, that we will. Right. So and, and I, it just, you know, at the, at, at the end of the day, we are an advisory board to the county commission, right? So I, I wouldn't be an advocate of just, you know, unless the staff really feel like, you know, it needs more work and you, you want to just pull it for that reason. You know, I, I, I don't think that the county commission should not see this. I think they should just be aware that we had some real concerns and we're recommending that we don't act on it now. But procedural question. Um, yeah. We'll motion in a second. So. Okay. Um, so Thank you. And typically they have a vote or they have a vote to amend. You know, Stephen, I'm not sure that I heard your question clearly. Would you mind repeating yeah. it? So, you know, I, I'm not even sure we actually uh, operate under Robert's Rules of Order, but, you know, if we do or how meetings are conducted are, is up to the chair. But typically when you have a motion a second, uh, it would require a motion to amend the motion to say that we're not going to have a vote. So it's a procedural question. I, well, we have a motion and a second. And right now we're just kind of having our final open discussion. And then we'll go to the vote on the original amend, or, um, motion. Okay. Then if we want to either revise the motion or have a second, motion then we can go down that path at least that's how i saw it am i incorrect uh, i saw it that sounds right to me we were discussing the motion i think right we we're just final discussions okay and, all right and, uh, I, and think I just wanted to just clarify because I, I you know just want to make sure to do it but okay. if staff wishes to pull it uh versus it not going through a, uh, the voting process that motion to amend would need, need to be of the original motion itself so you're saying we need to amend the original motion to include whether or not staff should pull it from the actual recommendation to the board or whether it should go to the board that we've recommended they pull it. If under Roberts, you know, the motion and the second is about the original motion that you made Mary and um, and there would be enough yes, no on that. If it didn't pass, then then there could be a new motion. But if somebody wanted to amend a motion, it be, would be amending your motion, Mary, which we would fir first hear the amendment of the yay and nay of the modifying of your original motion. 
Can we be reminded of the language of Mary's original motion? <laughs> Darcy, did you get that or do you want me to attempt? I didn't get it for verbatim. Okay, I can attempt then. Um, so, Brian, I think the question was, my motion actually said uh, I would right. move to remove it. It did not say whether we should have staff remove it. So it was us recommending removal. I, I that that's the way I would personally phrase it is a yes. recommendation to the commission that it be withdrawn. This section be removed from the proposal and taken up at a later date. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I don't. I don't want to. So does it work I, if I does it work if I clarify the motion was that we so. recommend removal of it? I agree. Okay. I just don't want to put staff in that position, right? It, it's us saying we have a real concern about this. And that's the point is to make the commission know that we had a serious concern. You know, it's not to not let them see what the proposal was initially. Is that I clear guess, for you, Stephen? Yes, it does. Thank you. I guess, and I guess that's what I, what I was questioning, trying to clarify. Does this mean the staff's going to pull it or not? It doesn't, I don't think anyone had interpreted it to mean that. Just meant this is what we recommend to the commission. Okay. Yeah, the clarification of the motion meant we recommend right. to the board that they pull it. Our recommendation yeah, yeah. to okay. the board is to pull it. Got it. I'm good with that. Okay, I think we're done with our final discussion. Um, Darcy, could you give us a roll call, please? <clears throat> Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stevens. Yes, aye. Commissioner Pasco. Aye. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Nay. Commissioner Pack. Aye. Commissioner Schrodel. Aye. Is that it? Okay, so seven motion. ayes, one nay. Yes, seven in favor and one nay. Is that what you have? Very good. Correct. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> I think we're, and was there anything else? Are we feeling comfortable with that motion and going forward and we're good to go? Section 10. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're glad. <laughs> uh, all right, and I believe we're down to the last one. Final yeah. stretch, Glenn. All right, uh, we're entering share screen mode once again. Hold your seats. Let's see. <laughs> we got some choice photographs for you. All right, the last item on the agenda is about the regulation of those small cell wireless facilities. And again, the proposal is to amend the ZBO so that these devices, small wireless facilities, that are in public rights of way are regulated under the county's roadway standards. But then when they're on private property, they are regulated under the zoning code. And uh, the proposal includes a review process that meets the FCC's shot clock uh, requirements, essentially the deadlines by which we have to make a determination on somebody's proposal to install a small wireless facility. And uh, it also requires that small wireless facilities that are installed on private property uh, not be on any vegetation uh, and must match either the same or, as now proposed in attachment E, a similar color as any portion or portions of a building that they might be attached to. And uh, so, that's, so that's that issue. Uh, any questions about that topic? I, I, have. I have my hand raised for discussion, but it's not a question of staff. Go ahead, Mary. I just wanted to make sure if anybody had questions of staff, we could do that first. I have one quick question. Can, can you point me to the language of the same or similar color? And Yeah, it's going to be in attachment E, and maybe I will just uh, pull that up here on the screen as well. It's all the way towards the end. Let's see. Yeah, so much paper here. 
<laughs> yeah, it's going to be on of attachment E. If you look all the way in the top right hand corner, it's page 151 of 153. All the way through. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And so uh, all that has changed since the last time we met is that I've inserted this provision so that it now reads uh, if the small wireless facility is attached to or mounted on a building. It must have the same or similar color or colors as the portions of the building they are attached to or mounted on. And this is in response to the concern that we discussed last month about a uh, supplier's ability to find a small wireless facility that uh, device that can match the color. People have expressed concerns that any requirement to apply paint might interrupt the functionality of the device. There's also concerns that maybe applying some um, film to the device could interrupt the signal or just the supply, the availability of these materials in colors of portions of the building that they're attached to might be limited. Um, staff's position is that this is a very standard requirement in other jurisdictions that have already acted on this FCC mandate. So it seems like it could be reasonable. Indeed, the San Diego uh, guidelines that Commissioner Schrodel referred us to and that are included in your packet um, requires in many instances that it just plain match the color. And some of the photos that they sh include in their guidelines show that they can come in all sorts of different colors. I'd say one of staff's biggest concerns about the actual language of how regulations of these might be drafted is making sure that they are clear and objective partly because that's a requirement of the FCC mandate, specifically that the regulations be published in advance, meaning that people ought to be able to know what the rules of the game are on the books ahead of time. And then also, we just want to not have uh, any ambiguity that the staff have to interpret, um, especially given just uh, our limited technical understanding of this technology. Um, and uh, again, uh, the FCC mandate applies now. We already have to allow these devices, uh, even on private property. Right now, though, we just don't have any regulations, even on the aesthetics of these devices. And so we're proposing in the kind of limited scope of this minor amendments project, something that can at least seem uh, reasonable for what we should expect of uh, those deploying it carriers when they put them on private property. Uh, that's all I have to say on this. Someday I'll tell you about the, my wife's and I's, our difference of opinion between scarlet red and pink. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in full honesty, I, maybe similar is sometimes a hard word, but I think we can probably staff can interpret that fair enough that staff can identify what is a similar color. Yeah, I think your language is reasonable. I think it's it's right. I, I'm curious if you got, did you get any feedback from the industry around that language? Not since uh, the last time that they spoke at the previous hearing. Yeah. No additional comments on. I, I just, I, I feel your language addresses the concerns that was raised and it's, it's very reasonable. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not watching hands. Uh, Mary. <laughs> yeah. Um. So at our last meeting, I had recommended substantially similar instead of similar. I think it's a little bit more clear while still giving a little bit of flexibility for not being able to match exactly. Um, and that Brian addresses the difference between pink and scarlet red <laughs> right. um, or maybe light green and dark green. Um, so I would recommend substantially similar rather than similar in the language. Um, and then I had two other recommendations for the guidelines for these in looking at the county roadway standards 7.15.6 aesthetics for these um, it also recommends or requires the use of non-reflective materials and requires that lighting should be shrouded to the extent possible from nearby properties and i would recommend adding those two as items three and four to um, the standards in the zdo for um those not in the roadway, basically, those covered in the ZDO. Very good. Um, what would we do without you? 
<laughs> Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And I'll second that. Uh, Murph. Uh, you're on you're on mute. Okay, I was just gonna say, uh, make it simple. Make it like brushed nickel, but obviously we can't have that if it's reflective. Uh, we'd have to have something matte finish or something of that nature. So I'm leaving it open. Um, Stephen? My question is to Glenn, and it has to do with uh, the uh, private property setback. And can you help me, is that addressed? And if so, what page? Uh, it is not specifically addressed in this proposal. Uh, let me pull up on my screen. Uh, so right now under the proposal, any of these devices, when they're not attached to a building, or indeed if they're attached to the building, have to meet the same structural setbacks as the underlying zoning district. Uh, there's nothing in the proposal that would say that these devices are exempt from the structural setbacks of anything else in the zone. So if somebody were to put a small wireless facility just on its own pole um, out in a yard in a residential district, uh, depending on its square footage, uh, it will have to meet certain setback requirements. But uh, you might recall from our earlier discussions that our sense is that the priority for deployment of these devices, at least initially in the rollout, is largely going to be in uh, commercial and industrial areas. And it's not always the case that those zones have any setback requirement for any other structure, uh, at least from things like side lot lines. Um, so uh, if it answers your question, there's no proposed exemption from the standard setback requirements of anything else of the same dimensions in the underlying zone. They would have to meet the same setback requirements. So then I follow up to that is, uh, so all side and front setbacks would still exist. Uh, would there, is there a procedure for them for any uh, carrier to seek a variance of the setback and the height so that it actually wouldn't come back to us. It would just uh, go through the, the different process. Yep, conceivably uh, somebody could apply for a variance to this setback, to the setback requirement for one of these structures. Um, you can get a variance to basically any dimensional standard, including a setback. You just would need to show how the request for the variance meets the established approval criteria. And the approval criteria aren't just like, well, I'd rather not meet the setback. It would look fine if it would anyway, please let me. There are some established criteria that any exception to a setback standard has to meet. And uh, you could conceivably apply for a variance to a setback for one of these structures if one applied to it, uh, but it would have to meet the same criteria. And then I just wanted to, uh, you know, be transparent because I, I would like everybody to understand my concern it is if there was a variance for like a side yard setback and they, uh, a pole could be within the, uh, right on the property line, uh, we could create situations where neighbors would have uh, difficulties uh, talking to each other because uh, that could encroach onto their land because uh, the antennas are not attached to the pole itself. They protrude out from. And so I want to make sure that they don't ever protrude on this else's land at the 50 foot mark, but also uh, what would prevent both neighbors from having a pole that would interfere with each other. I'll just say on that topic that if there was ever an application for a variance to a setback requirement for uh, a small wireless facility or anything else, the application for the variance uh, is one of those application types that gets sent out for public notice. So um, neighbors would understand that somebody was asking for an exception and would be given an opportunity to comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carrie? Um. I really liked the changes that was made. I thought that was um, uh, met the needs of our very lengthy discussion of last time we got together to talk about this. Just had a real quick question. I also thought that this um, San Diego uh, guidelines was super thorough. Is the county planning on adopting something like this or just 
stealing from city of San Diego to make it implementable for our uses? It's a public document and all. I thought I was complimenting them by copying them. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's just my, that, that's all for my question. Uh, well, I don't know of myself any intention to include a deeper look at this topic uh, in the near future, but certainly I guess it could be uh, put out there as uh, an idea for something to look at uh, in the future with other topics as well. Uh, right now, we're kind of in this spot of trying to meet this FCC mandate that applies now, have something on the books, and to sort of fold this into this minor and time-sensitive amendments package so we have something. But uh, if the resources and interests uh, support looking at it deeper in the future. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of similar to the discussion we just got through having with the Philo, I think it's really important for the staff to have um, specific guidelines by which certain criteria get implemented. So it, it, to the extent that we need to meet the FCC requirement, I totally get that. And maybe we don't have time to go through all of this just yet, but I would recommend that um, just for your, you all's lives, uh, you know, ease of uh, approving these um, applications that may come through, the more clear guidelines you have, the easier that's going to be in the long run. So, and I understand that um, it takes time and effort to make that happen, so. Are there any other comments for staff? Wow. Do we have a motion? Oh, go ahead, Glenn. Uh, yeah. Oh, awesome. We have hands. Go ahead, Glenn. <laughs> sure, I don't want to interrupt the commissioner uh, if there's a more urgent question. I just wanted to say one thought about the, um, the shrouding of the devices. Uh, as Commissioner Phillips pointed out, in the county's roadway standards, they are they have a regulation that says lighting should be shrouded to the extent possible from nearby properties um and this is a regulation that they would implement and know what it means it may be less easy for planning staff to interpret from a clear and objective standard what to the extent possible or practical actually means Do you have any similar lighting standards for between neighboring properties that you could reference? Only for, we do for projects that go through design review. So we don't have anything that would apply just generally in residential areas, but if you're doing commercial, industrial, multifamily, there are lighting requirements. Um, I think in that case though, there's no out for whether it's possible. You just can't shine onto adjacent properties. So is the theory here, Glenn, that they might not, they might, if we told them they couldn't shine light on neighboring properties, that they might not be able to actually do that and meet their requirements for the device? Um, maybe the concern is that if the regulation allowed for uh, lighting to not be shrouded, if it is not possible to shroud it, um, staff would be in the position of needing to evaluate, is it indeed possible for them to shroud it or is it not? Hmm. Uh, Murph, did you have a question? Yes, uh, last uh, meeting I asked a question about co-locations. So if we have a pole go up, AT&T puts one on, how far away will we see a Verizon pole? Will there be a setback or could someone actually have three or four of these things on their property uh, with T-Mobile, AT&T and Verizon? Uh, the answer is yes, under the current proposal on private property. There's nothing in the proposal that would limit um, any, the amount of small cell wireless facilities that a private property owner could put on their property. Um, or require them to be spaced um, a certain distance from any other or require that they be co-located on a pole. Um, there's nothing in the regulations for that. Should we look at that, you think? Uh, the carriers actually operate under different frequencies. There is a half harmonic of each frequency that 
but there is uh, distinctive licensed frequencies uh, from the FCC. So they can coexist. The question is, um, you know, how powerful are they beaming out from each location? But uh, the towers we see around the town, there's multiple carriers on, on all of the towers. And I believe on cell phone, uh, it's required in Clackamas County, is it not, Jennifer? That I am from the CPO side of things, we've seen where if you can, you have to co locate on cell. Right. So, yes, our normal. Our normal wireless telecommunication facilities, they have to demonstrate that there's a reason that they, there's some language. They have to co-locate, they have to co-locate if they can. They have to build new facilities to accommodate co-location. But I thought, and I am not the expert on this at all, I thought that we maybe were preempted from requiring co-location for these small cell wireless. And I thought the industry had said that they didn't really think that they could do that. And what I've heard is that the expectation is there'll be a full network for all of our major providers on separate facilities in the right way. But maybe I misunderstood that along the way. I'll, I'll add to it. I mean, uh, so the different li license frequencies they have, they each frequency actually propagates uh, differently. So the distance between uh, the macro cell to the micro cell is going to be less or more depending on what frequencies they have. Um, as far as co-locating, I heard them say, yes, they would if they were required to, but because some one of the carriers can go farther, they're not going to co-locate where, where they don't have to. And where somebody can't get to the where they want to get, they're going to have to do more polls to redistribute. Um, it's, there's going to be polls uh, until additional frequencies happen. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, uh, Murph? Oh, I already asked mine. Sorry. Okay, and Mary? Um, so to follow up on the lighting shrouding, in order to get something a little bit more clear and objective for staff to implement, I would say that primarily we're probably worried about lighting onto adjacent residential properties. So I would say um, lighting should be shrouded, shall be shrouded from adjacent residential properties. And then that would be more clear and objective for staff to administer, but still get at where we would want lighting not to happen. Mm -hmm. And my question to Mary, uh, just from hearing that, is, is this a, a lighting that like a, a navigation prevention collision light? Is that what we're thinking of? Because that depends on how tall the pole is or the uh, you know, the, the taller it is and more isolated it is, then they have uh, beacons that go off to prevent collisions. But uh, definitely, if we already have a code that says we can't shine a light onto a neighbor's location, as long as it doesn't shroud the anti-collision function of the device. If that needs to be made clear, I'm fine with adding that it that the anti-collision safety should still be able to stay. Um, the language I'm using is based off of what was in the county roadway standards. And, and I'll just add by saying, yes, I agree. I just don't, I don't know the height uh, of the building envelope that would require the lighting for the small poles. I mean, most of these aren't over 50 feet, right, Glenn, unless there's some adjacent structure that's already taller than that? Correct. Yeah, they could be, the actual small cell device might be uh, 100 feet off the ground uh, if it is on, you know, a 90 foot tall building. Right. Any other comments? Oh my, we may have done it. I'm very excited. <laughs> Mary, would you have an, a motion? I can make, I can make a motion, yeah. <laughs> um, so I would move that we recommend approval of item number 10 based on staff's recommendation with the following modifications um, that uh, item 803.06E for small wireless facilities number two be amended to read same or substantially similar color. 
that an item number three is added, reading use non-reflective materials, and an item number four be added that lighting shall be shrouded from adjacent residential properties. And do we have a second? I'll second. Great, Murph, very good. Do we have any further discussion? All right, I think we're ready for roll call, Darcy. You're, you're on mute. Maybe you can go in reverse chrono chronological order this time. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I hate being the first one. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, well, then I'm going to go from what I have as uh, clockwise. Commissioner Stevens. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Pack. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Schrodel. Aye. Commissioner Pasco. Aye. <laughs> I believe we have a in favor. Very good. Okay. Wow. Congratulations, Glenn and team. <laughs> that was a marathon. And I think very well done for everyone. Okay, uh, I can we now close the hearing? Are we at that point, Glenn? Are we are we complete? There's nothing else that needs to be addressed. We very are, good. yeah. Thank you all uh, for your patience in these issues uh, and my explanation of some of them. <laughs> I appreciate it. You Thank were you for your patience <laughs> with us. <laughs> yes. Uh, and Ken, thank you for your support this evening. It was really, really helpful. And congrats, Glenn. This is a big feat. All right. I think we'll move along with the agenda then. Do we have any other business? Jennifer or Darcy or? I think we have minutes. Minutes. We do. That's number six. Uh, we have like a book. Good heavens. We know what you do in your off time, Darcy. <laughs> A five-page set of minutes. Um, I have reviewed it. I don't have any uh, corrections. Does anyone else? No, we're getting lots of head shakes. Okay. Uh, let me down, Mary. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> you're, letting me, you're letting me down. You don't have corrections for minutes. <laughs> yeah, not this time. Can we accept minutes by acclamation or do we have to have a motion? We usually do a motion, I think. Motion. Okay. Okay. I'll accept a motion then. I'll move to accept the June 22nd, 2020 minutes as written. Very good. A second? Second. Michael seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Alrighty. We'll take a roll call, Darcy. You can go in any direction you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I'm going to just mess with you guys. There you go. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Pasco. There we go. It is Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Phillip. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Schrodel. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Pack. Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. And Commissioner Stevens? Aye. Very good. Unanimous. Okay. I think we're on to schedule review, which I believe is on the back of our agenda. So your next two meetings are canceled. We don't have any items for um, July, what would it be, 27 um, or August 10th? We will have a public hearing for a comprehensive plan amendment when zone change to rural industrial for a specific piece of property that I think is kind of north of Estacada, but I might be wrong about that. It's, anyway, um, on August 24th. So that'll be your next item. Um, Melissa Ahrens, who I believe you've met once when we did the floodplain amendment. So some of you have met her once. Um, is the lead staff on that, and uh, Martha Fritzi is providing some 
backup and mentoring because she's done this before. So you'll see, I believe, both of them um, at your hearing on August 24th. Is the August 10th and July 27th meeting officially canceled or we just, okay. Officially canceled, right. I didn't want to do that until I was sure you were going to complete this business tonight because we could have needed a continuance, but since we don't, uh, next two are canceled. Very good. All right. And finally, uh, let's see, schedule review and, oh my goodness, uh, unless there's any other business that someone would like to bring up this evening, we can adjourn. Any other business? All right, let's adjourn the meeting at 848. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Darcy. Good night, everybody. Good night. Everybody. Good night. I'm under this desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>